This is a review of the highlights of the content on pulmonary embolus that we covered in class during our case study. Mr. Chester Klott is a 70-year-old male patient on the medical surgical unit. He's two days status post-hip surgery. He calls for a nurse and reports shortness of breath, chest pain, and appears anxious. What risk factors does Mr. Klott have for the DVT? That would be his advanced age and the fact that he had um, orthopedic surgery and he is two days post-op. How does the DVT become a pulmonary embolus? The blood clot in the leg breaks off, travels to the lungs, and blocks the circulation to an area of the lung. What are the additional clinical risk factors for DVT or pulmonary embolus? And that would be box 10-10 on page 302. What measures do you take to prevent DVT or pulmonary embolus? And that would be on pages 502 and 503 in your Pelico textbook. What specific signs and symptoms does Mr. Klott have of a pulmonary embolus? That would be his shortness of breath, his chest pain, and his anxiety. What additional signs and symptoms should he be assessed for? And that would be on page 303 in your textbook. The question is pleuritic pain related to pulmonary embolus, prominent on inspiration or expiration. And that would be prominent on inspiration. Uh, part of your diagnosis when a patient presents with chest pain would be to have them take a deep breath if it worsens with breathing, then it's probably not a cardiovascular issue, it's more likely a pulmonary issue. Mr. Clot expectorates into a tissue. What are you expecting the tissue for? That would be bloody sputum, otherwise known as hemoptysis, which is one of the signs of a pulmonary embolus. Diagnostics for pulmonary embolus. Patients will have a chest x-ray to rule out other pulmonary issues. CAT scans to try to locate where the clot is, uh, ABGs to uh, evaluate the patient's oxygenation and perfusion, uh, Doppler or impedance plethysmography, which are ultrasound studies to detect the presence of a DVT, and then the two tests that are more of a definitive diagnosis for the pulmonary embolism itself. The first one they would do is a pulmonary angiogram. Uh, this is similar to the coronary artery angiogram, uh, the cardiac cath, where they inject a dye, uh, usually accessing through the femoral artery, into the pulmonary circulation and um, try to visualize where the clot uh, might be. Contraindications for this would be any allergies to shellfish or iodine, uh, but also if the patient has renal insufficiency, that would be a contraindication. This patient would not be able to excrete the dye through their kidneys, which is very important to be able to do post-procedure. So the PrEP would be asking that question, whether the patient has any allergies, and also reviewing the labs to make sure that there is no renal insufficiency. Post-procedure, you would be assessing the cannulation site for any bleeding or blood clots. You would be assessing distal pulses to make sure that they have adequate circulation distal to that cannulation site. You're going to be doing strict INOs to make sure that they are excreting sufficiently. And you're going to be assessing for any adverse reactions to the dye in case they do develop an allergic reaction. For that patient who cannot have a pulmonary angiogram, they would get a ventilation perfusion or VQ scan. This is a nuclear medicine procedure Patients inhale a radioactive isotope to detect whether or not they are ventilating appropriately. And then they have an isotope injected to evaluate their perfusion. One of the lab tests that they will do is called a D-dimer, which detects the presence of abnormal clotting and the results of natural anticoagulation by the body. It measures the presence of fibrin degradation products it's not definitive for pulmonary embolus because it could indicate clots or other abnormal clotting elsewhere in the body, but it will be part of your diagnostic profile. And now the treatments for pulmonary embolus. The primary priority treatment for pulmonary embolus is, of course, oxygen. Your second type of treatment, and as long as we are able to do this within six hours of the onset of symptoms would be to administer thrombolytics. Thrombolytics dissolve the clot, 
versus anticoagulants, which prevent the formation of new clots. Specific uh, thrombolytics that uh, you might hear the names of would be something like Alteplase, Renovase, uh, TPA, um, and Streptokinase. One of the things that you do need to be aware of with Streptokinase, because it was developed from the strep bacteria, it can cause anaphylaxis. Our primary risk factor for patients that are on um, thrombolytics would be bleeding. In terms of your medications, your anticoagulants, we'll start off with heparin, which can be given intravenously or subcutaneously. The lab test that we monitor for heparin is the APTT, the Activated Partial Thromboplastin Time. The normal control or reference range is around 18 to 28, but that will differ depending on the lab that you use. The therapeutic range, which is the target where you want your patient to be while they are being anticoagulated, would be one and a half to two times the control value. Um, patients who have a history of DVT, have had mechanical valve replacements, may even be anticoagulated up to two and a half times that control, normal, or reference range. The antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. The next medication would be Lovenox, low molecular weight heparin, that is also given sub-Q. We would monitor uh, PTINR, we would monitor CBC for platelets. That is given, um, uh, um, can be given by the patient themselves, by family members, so it's much easier to send a patient home with Lovenox. The antidote for that medication is also protamine sulfate. And then we have Coumadin Warfarin, which is an oral medication. We monitor the PTINR, particularly the INR. Uh, the normal control or reference range for the PT is 12 to 14, 11 to 16. Again, it may change based on your lab. Your INR is about 0.8 to 1.2. Those are your normal control reference ranges. Those are what people should be at if they're not being anticoagulated. The therapeutic range uh, the target is always 2.0 to 3.0 for the INR. Vitamin K is the antidote for Coumadin. The two surgical procedures you might see would be an embolectomy, which we, would be the surgical removal of the clot, or an inferior vena cava filter, also known as a Greenfield filter, which is a basket-like device which is um, inserted into the IVC to catch clots that are coming up from the lower extremities. It is heparinized, the clots uh, stick there, they dissolve on their own and are reabsorbed by the body. A more recent and much more effective method of administering thrombolytics is through the ecosonic endovascular system. This is where they thread a uh, catheter into the area where the clot is located and administer the thrombolytic directly into the clot which has advantages of a less systemic effect of the thrombolytics on the patient since it's only going into the area where the clot is located. 50 to 70 percent less of the drug can be used and uh, there is a much greater uptake of that thrombolytic into the clot and a better result in terms of dissolving the clot. So this is something that you might see on some of your high acuity units. So now Mr. Clot is going home. So some of the discharge concerns and referrals that you might be um, performing when Mr. Clot goes home, he'll probably go home on Coumadin. So he will need to make an appointment with the lab or you will make a re referral to the visiting nurse to come in and do the lab draws. He's at risk for recurrent DVT pulmonary embolus. He has mobility and gait issues related to his hip surgery. So you might need a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, and just some general safety issues that would be very helpful to have a visiting nurse to do some teaching regarding safety, medications, and doing some assessments. The teaching that you would perform in terms of his discharge would be his Coumadin precautions and the labs that need to be drawn, risk factors and prevention of another DVT or pulmonary embolus, and general safety and mobility issues.